This situation continues to have a devastating impact on a number of industries and travel is most certainly one of them. But one day it will be over, uh, although the travel industry, of course, might look very different by this point. So for this reason, we're going to be beginning, beginning today uh, with a session by futurologist James Wallman, who will explore what travel experiences might look like in the future as we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis. We'll then move on to our New Horizons session as a panel of aviation experts examine the devastating impact the coronavirus pandemic has had on the sector and how airlines and airports are adapting to the crisis. We'll have a short half hour break at 3.30 uh, before we return at four with a session exploring the new legal landscape with top advice for businesses needing to get their own houses in order, ready for when those bookings do return. And we'll conclude today with a session dedicated to the issue of refunds, which continues to dominate uh, the industry and how the sector can move forwards and ensure they have the trust of consumers. Before we begin today, uh, we have introduced a new element to today's seminar. To help us as a business to continue providing online seminar content such as this, we are asking delegates to consider making a donation to attend today's event. We'll donate 20% of all contributions to NHS charities together to support staff and volunteers who are working so, so hard uh, to care for COVID-19 patients during these challenging times. If you do wish to make a contribution, please do visit ttgmedia.com forward slash contribution and a huge, huge thank you to those who do so. Um, just a few other housekeeping bits. Uh, as, as before, the seminars have all been pre-recorded, but they do all feature up to the minute advice. Uh, we've made sure that they are as relevant as they possibly can be. Um, but we are going to be conducting, um, as before, the live Q&As after each session with all of the panelists. Um, so please can I ask you all to use the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen rather than the chat function to ask your questions. Um, for those of you who are fans of Twitter, we always welcome any social media love. Um, please feel free to use the hashtag TTG seminar or the one travel industry hashtag and as ever we will be making these sessions available afterwards um, it will likely be monday because of the bank holiday um, please do keep an eye on ttgmedia.com after the event and of course we really do value your feedback um, we'll be sending out a survey again after today's event so please do let us know your thoughts right it's time now to go to our first session of the afternoon COVID-19 has changed our lives in ways we could never have imagined just a few months ago as we emerge from this crisis, the world is likely to be a very different place. But what does this mean for the travel industry? Futurologist James Walsman explains how the sector will change and what firms need to do now to ensure they're ready for the new world. Hello everybody, how are you? I hope you're well and um, is enjoying working from home with kids and stuff, the right thing. So I think it's sort of, just before doing this, I've um, had to make sure my kids are at the back of the house and my wife really has them in lockdown. So they understand they are not to come upstairs and bang on the door and come in and demand that I come and play with them or whatever. Um, I imagine you're going through the same thing. Uh, it's a real honor to be here today. I've been working in travel since, wow, well, since the nineties when I first left university, I worked for the Thompson holidays and the Crystal holidays. And so when uh, Sophie came to me last week and said, would I like to, you know, use my skills as a, as a futurist to uh, give my view of the future? Um, of course, I said, yes, I will, I will do that. Um, so I've had some real fun uh, connecting with uh, people I know in the travel industry and in other places and thinking about what's going to happen next. Okay, so this is my view on traveling in a new world, what the new normal of travel will look like. And if your view of the future is basically just informed by other people and just like, oh, this person said this, you know, this publication said this, I saw this on the BBC, whatever, then all you're going to do is, is, is be a follower. And I think if you want to have something to say in those meetings and if you want to create a better product and you want to connect with the right customers at the right time and help rebuild travel, I think the best way to do that is to, to be a leader and to have your own view. So hopefully I'm going to provide some tools to do that. So we'll start with the problem. Um, then I'll talk about the answer. The answer, by the way, is a question. We'll see that. Why listen to me? Why am I here in the first place? Like I say, I don't think you should listen to me. I think you should need to have your own view of the future. I'm going to throw in some travel trends. I'll talk about how I've come up with those and then look at some key questions. So the problem, of course, the problem is coronavirus, right? And the fact they're all stuck at home. No one can even leave their home, let alone get on a boat or a plane and go somewhere. But one of the problems with 
doing a piece on you know what the future of travel is is that predictions are always wrong just like models it's just a question of how wrong they are but predictions are particularly wrong during a crisis and there's lots of people um probably like me you're in different whatsapp groups and i seem to be there's one of my whatsapp groups is like travel writers and authors and they're all kind of like drinking quite a lot and then I, another group i'm with uh, a very political and connected kind of columnists and uh sort of quite important people at the World Economic Forum and stuff. And they're really um, excited about how things might change and how this is the great opportunity for change. But if you look at previous uh, pandemics and problems, things tend to kind of come back to where they were. Now, of course, things change. Uh, and this is an opportunity for some changes to, to be accelerated. But so the kind of predictions of um, you know, the idea that Greta Thunberg will, will get her way and we'll all be super eco after this is, is a lovely idea, but I'm not sure if that's true. So then also, what kind of future are we looking at? Are we talking about just after lockdown, once this, you know, this, this entire lockdown thing stops? Are we talking about pre-vaccine, post-vaccine? Let's be real, there isn't a definite situation where there will be a vaccine. Um, you've probably come across the letter-shaped forecast, McKinsey, uh, it was really early with those with the kind of U, the V, the W, uh, the L shape. And from what we're seeing in China, it looks like L shape is more realistic. Uh, those things are fun, but they're just I'm not sure how exactly useful they are. And then think about the travel industry. Sure, that, that matters. Um, but what really matters is your sector or the sectors that you work in, because, you know, this will be a uh you know a bumpy ride to the future and some will do well and some will do badly and what really is key is how adaptable you are this is a lovely quote from a guy who was the mayor of chicago never let a serious crisis go to waste it's an opportunity to do things you think you couldn't do before so let's not let the coronavirus as a you know huge problem go to waste what can you do that's going to be different that's going to make you more robust and adaptable in the future okay so the answer I almost want to do a drum roll here, um, but don't get too disappointed because the answer is a question. The question is, how might we? How might we get people traveling with us again? And I, if I was you watching this, I'd be like, oh, thanks. That's not an answer. But the answer is the how might we? This is something that was um, developed at Stanford University. It's used by companies like IDEO, the design firm. And this is about design thinking. How might we is a wonderful way to phrase any problem that you ever have. The how means there is a solution, it makes you feel positive. The might means you can kind of play with ideas and we makes it collaborative. Because if you say, how can we, you suddenly think about things you can't do. And obviously the challenge is to rebuild the travel industry piece by piece. Okay, so why bother listening to me? Very briefly, I've been a forecaster and innovator since 2004. I wrote this book called Stuffication um, published originally self-published in 2013 about how we're moving from materialism to what I call experientialism instead of looking for happiness identity and status and stuff we're finding those things in experiences instead and my firm works with lots of different clients from Avis to Visa um, I'm now a sector specialist at the Department for International Trade um, specializing in the experience economy I work with a number of different travel clients the pioneers like Black Tomato and uh, Brown and Hudson to bigger firms like Kayak and Marriott's Design Hotels. Um, I wrote this book, um, Time and How to Spend It. The FT very kindly named it one of the books of the year last year. Um, and this fits very nicely with Stuffocation. So Stuffocation was not stuff experiences instead. And this is how to spend your time, how to choose experiences that are more likely to make you happy and successful in life. What's really interesting about this is that if you think about that from a personal perspective, you can flip the ideas and use exactly the same set of ideas. And there's, there's seven rules, seven principles that you can use to design somebody's experiences too. Hence, I've been working with lots of uh, experienced led firms. Okay, but I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to have your own view of the future. So I'm going to explain how I figure out what's going to come next and why that's useful. So. My work is inspired by, and it's, it's based on something called the diffusion of innovations, which explains how ideas take off. So ideas from the take up of microwave ovens to foreign holidays to skateboards follow this curve. It's called the diffusion of innovations as an S curve. 
and it's codified in 1962. What happens is you get a bunch of people who do things first. They're called the innovators. They're the crazies. They're the, um, um, you know, they're the people that have given up an iPhone to have a Xiaomi phone or some sort of, you know, they're the people that went to Bhutan first. They're the people who will do the crazy thing, who are into hip hop back in the 70s and the early 80s. Then you get the early adopters. This is when ideas start to really take off. And then, as you can see, early majority, late majority, and laggards. The work that I do, I've been doing since 2004, is I look at what the innovators and early adopters are doing today to forecast what everyone else is going to be doing in the future. And um, the thing is, it's worth pointing this out, most ideas don't take off. Um, the Sinclair C5 is a fantastic example. Google Glass is another one. But when they do, you can figure out what's um, going to happen. I'm going to show you this thing called the, the future canvas um, that will help you think about the difference between the innovations that are going to take off and the ones that aren't. And once you understand that, you can influence that takeoff curve. So in terms of obesity is a really good example. Now we know obesity is coming. We can try and get rid of it. But if you see something taking off, let's think about we, we want the innovators and the early adopters of the, let's call it the new travel in 2019, uh, 2020 and 2021, post lockdown to, to um, you know, to go, go travel faster. You can start to influence um, that curve as well. And let's face it, if we think of travel at the moment at the kind of zero point at the far left of this with nothing happening, it will come back and it will follow one of these S curves. And what we all want to do is for the travel industry, for our particular sector, and for our individual firms, we want that curve to be as steep as possible. So understanding who your innovator and who your early adopter customers are, I think is going to be critical. Because if you can get those guys to get traveling again at the right time, of course, when it's appropriate, the others will follow. So if we can figure out if an innovation is going to take off, you need to consider two things. The seed and the soil is the way I think about this. The seed is the innovation. Um, some of you may have been doing more gardening since you've been stuck at home. It certainly seems to be a thing uh, where I am. My local pub is now selling plants uh, to keep themselves going. Quite adaptable, quite impressive, actually. Um, if you think about when a seed goes into ground, if it's a good seed and it's rich alluvial soil and it's well watered, it's likely to grow. Uh, a really good seed, but in dry, sandy um, soil won't grow. At the same time, great soil on its own with no seed, nothing will happen. So it's really, I think, useful to think about the innovation as the seed. You can ask five questions and then think about the macro environment as the soil. And there are 10 questions to ask about the soil. Um, I'm just pausing. Is this pace okay? Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah it's really good. I'm really enjoying it. Okay, so uh, the five questions to ask of the seed, um, as I think I might have mentioned, this has been, uh, this was codified in 1962. It's been applied more than 5,000 times and this stuff works. It's how I've been forecasting this since 2004. I'm making a reasonable career out of it, so it must kind of work, but it, I, I, I like this way of thinking about this quite simply. Is this innovation better? Is it easy to try? Is it compatible with how we do things now? Think about something being non-deviant. Is it observable? Will, will people see you doing it? Is it simple to understand? Think about Boris bikes as a fantastic example. Um, yes, they're a better way of getting around London. Uh, um, let's think, you know, pre-lockdown, of course. Is it easy to try? Yes, you put your card and you jump on one. Is it compatible? Yeah, people move from one place to another and they need to get there quickly, plus we will understand cycling. Is it observable? Think about the, the times that you've seen a group of four or five friends on a Friday night or Saturday or something, and they look like they're having fun. You see them doing. Is it simple to understand? Yes, it's a bike you can use. Um, you can think about masks in this way. Face masks are really uh, interesting. We'll come to that in a moment. And then you need to think about the soil. And these 10 questions, they're based from um, work first conducted at the Rand Corporation in the 60s. Um, and I've put them, as you can see, into these two ideas of steeple and dust. I've added the dust, by the way, on the right-hand side, demographics, aesthetics, and science. Demographics are super important, I think, in a world of urbanization. Demographics, when you're thinking about your innovations, you might want to think about your specific customers as well. Aesthetics um, has been left out of the RAND Corporation's thinking and, and most firms forget about that. You can include user experience if you're designing your product as well. And science strikes me as something that just, you know, especially think about COVID-19, 
but also think about the work that I've done in terms of suffocation and time and how to spend it. And, and you know, um, if I'm going to, at least I have done, forecast that we're moving from material goods to experiences, one of the key things that's helped drive that is the, is the science that shows that experiences will make you happier than stuff. I feel like I'm whipping through this, but I'm going to continue. So what I wanted to do is show you, I've created this canvas where you can bring your ideas together and show somebody else why you believe something's going to happen. So you think about the seed as the because and the soil as the steeple. Uh, you'll see there's a seed where it says because, there's a steeple where a uh, kind of church thing, and the uh, the uh, submarine is because of uh, a U-boat, and there's the great German movie Dust Boat, so it's dust steeple. That makes helps me remember it anyway. But this keeps it really simple. One of the important things here, and I was having a great chat with um, a friend of mine, Sarah Wilson at Accor the other day, and we were disagreeing fundamentally about something interesting about um, how the future of travel is going to look. And um, the usefulness of this future canvas is that instead of just disagreeing about opinions, I think this is going to happen, I think that that is going to happen, you're able to surface your assumptions and then you can have a reasonable conversation. And if you do disagree, at the very least you can say, okay, we disagree because, ah, you think this is better, but I don't think so. Or I think the science supports my view, you don't think it does, or I think the technology is there, or the politics, the, the, the laws that are coming and whatever. So, this is okay, this is a really ugly slide, so forgive me, but this is quite a practical way of doing this in a digital format. There is a paper-based version you can use as well, but um, this is quite practical. I've, I found this useful to share things with people in a digital way, which is obviously useful now we're all working from home. So I'm going to run through a couple of examples, and then we'll get into some, some travel trends. So this was a few weeks ago, uh, no, it's about a month ago now, um, I was thinking, okay, face masks, what do I, what do I, what do I think about face masks? So, you know, are they going to take off? Aren't they going to take off? So I started by thinking about them from a C perspective, this innovation. Of course, they've been around in, um, you know, Asian people have used them for quite some time, but they've not really taken off here. So let's think about them. Are they better, easy to try, compatible, et cetera? So, okay, are they better? Yes, they stop coronavirus spreading. But actually, back in um, 7th of April, when I first started looking at this, it, the, the data on that seems to be a little bit spotty. To be frank, um, there seem suggestions there with these air droplets, etc. But I think one of the things that's better, and it's really worth thinking about this, is what does better mean? Um, cheaper can be better for some people. Um, showing status is really important for everybody. So better can be specifically relevant for your target demographic. They could, it could be, it's re relevant in different ways. So better is one of those kind of quite interesting, like well, it's a qualitative point, of course. But I think one of the things about wearing a mask now is it shows, shows status in that you care about others. You think about this, you know, the way that we talk about key workers now as being heroes and, the, you know, the clap for carers on a, on a Thursday night. Um, showing that you care about others, I think, is really important. Are they easy to try? Well, you just get one and put one on. You can make one at home. Are they compatible with, with how we do things now? I think um, no, and that's one of the reasons why they haven't taken off previously. You look like you're, you know, um, slightly abnormal, but actually that's obviously changed dramatically in the past month. But also it's an accessory. We all understand the idea of accessories. And interestingly, I'd, um, I posted this, I think, on a Friday, and somebody in one of the WhatsApp groups I'm in posted something, I, I shared this, uh, over the weekend that showed that um, fashion companies are doing this. And it actually, uh, there's a company called Embark in uh, New York, who I may mention later in the, in the presentation, uh, who are working with Fret, Freta, the Italian firm, to create masks for um, hotels. Um, it strikes me as a really obvious thing for a travel firm to make a face mask for people, because A, this is a way to connect with people right now and sh sh show that we care, but also the future of travel is going to require us to wear face masks. Okay, flipping forward, let's look at um, what's going on in the soil here. Okay, so legally, interesting, I think, that the UK has not made it mandatory. In some countries, it is mandatory to wear a mask when you're out. Um, the science is really interesting on this. So there's a paper that was in uh, the magazine uh, Nature that shows that um, people are most infectious in the first week after catching COVID-19 
And I think that's when you don't show in other ways too. So one of the one of the weird and interesting things about this thing, of course, is that you don't show the symptoms um, for some time. And of course, you'll catch, you know, um, you can pass it on during that time. I've seen some other data since I, I posted this thing about um, the future of face masks that shows very clearly that face masks really, really drastically reduce the chances of you passing on uh, COVID-19 and reduce the, uh, the R number to stop it spreading. So to me, they're going to um, be really important. So therefore, you know, having gone through this process of the scene of the soil, I can confidently say face masks will be a really important part of our society and of travel. That probably sounds really obvious now. A month ago when I was looking at this, it wasn't quite so obvious. I'm going to skip this one about immunity passports and health certificates because of time. Um, travel trends. Okay, so testing time. So this is, uh, I think, really interesting. Emirates is doing these uh, rapid tests where you get the results in 10 minutes. Wow. Um, I've got some real skepticism around these kind of ideas at the moment because, you know, um, testing show, does it set show up immediately if you've got it? But I think this is the kind of thing that we're going to have to look at. I think this next idea is fascinating. Thermal imaging. Um, this is the hostel area de España with an idea. We are seeing um, lots of smart travel firms doing smart stuff because, of course, people are concerned about this. The new hygiene factor. People have talked about this forever. But, you know, who's talked about hygiene? Hygiene is just expected. But this is going to be the new hygiene factor. People will be talking about this. Um, significantly in the probably next six to 12 months or so. Singapore, Singapore has this SG clean stamp. Accra has jumped onto this very quickly. I think one of the interesting things here is, is what this may do to uh, a firm like Airbnb, because if you think about it, one of the things that we love brands for is trust. And when you stay in a hotel, you're going to have a trust that they've gone through the process. I think what Accra have done working with this um, this organization, Bureau Veritas, that has been in the cleanliness and inspection business since 1828. There's a real sense of trust. These people know what they're doing. This is going to be, um, you know, disinfected on a regular basis. There's not going to be COVID-19 that we're going to catch when we're here. What's that going to mean for uh, smaller chains? Well, they're going to have to play catch up very, very quickly. Um, robots don't carry uh, diseases. This is amazing at Hong Kong Airport, this robot that sterilizes virtually everything in 10 minutes. Fantastic. Um, my passports, this came out of my work looking at health certificates. One of the things that people sort of said to me here is that people won't accept this, you know, this kind of invasion into our privacy. But you look at the, the reaction in France to having to take out a document saying why they are leaving the home, both by either a printed version or a self-certificated app. Almost no problems from Paris to uh, most people in the south of France. Um, and, and people just accepted this. And I think this idea of having a, a, a immunity passport, health certificates makes sense. One of the interesting things here, so the EU wants this to happen, but there seems to be a slight, you know, I mean, we really are in, a, in an evolving world. So making predictions at the moment is super hard, partly because of the fact that, so on the one hand, there's this idea that you should get an, an, let's call it an eye passport for the sake of argument, an immunity passport, COVID-19 passport. So um, sometimes they want you to get one of these that shows that you've had COVID-19. Now, as we all know, there are a couple of different strains. So if you've had one, maybe you haven't got the other, but also we don't yet know if you've had it, are you not going to get it again? Or it, there could be, you know, a health certificate says that you haven't had it. You, you don't present any of the, you know, the antibodies that suggest that you've had it, which is, uh, to me, it's just watch the space on this stuff. I think this is going to have to be there, but we need the science to support them. Um, the idea of preferred partners with New Zealand, Australia, suggesting they're going to have this, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the Anzac bubble, if you like, I think is really interesting. Interesting that other countries are looking to do this too. Um, Austria, Greece, really interested, especially for the Southern European countries for whom tourism is so important to their economies. They are desperate to get somebody in. Um, but not everybody's up for this. The Germans are refused this in particular. Um, staycations are going to be an important point. Domestic travel we've seen in China. Domestic travel has taken off uh, quicker, obviously. That makes sense. Um, this is a picture of my family. Um, 
uh, two kids, my wife and a dog. You can see in the corner there going to Richmond Park. It's not very far from where we live. And it's great when you're there because you're free, this huge space, two and a half thousand acres. But the tension point, of course, is the bottleneck. It's getting through that gate in the first point. So you have these kind of queues of people doing their two metre away. And of course, I'm bringing this up because you think about what that means for airlines and airports and the pictures that surfaced the other day about people on um, an Aer Lingus flight. Um, we're going to look at some weird and wacky solutions to that. I don't think I'd be a futurist if I didn't suggest something about virtual travel. I love virtual travel. It's super exciting. I'm not going to play the video for reasons of time. It's worth looking at these guys called Supernatural based in Los Angeles. It's the idea that you can do, you, you know, don't just do the work, Joe Wicks workout. You can do a workout somewhere else. This is really exciting and interesting, but it's still not the same as travel. It's its own thing. I think it will sit alongside. Video didn't kill the radio. Um, radio has gone up and up and up. This will sit alongside travel. Um, but you don't need to do virtual travel in a super techie way. This is really about bringing what's out there to the person, to, connect, to keep them connected to the destination, to keep them connected to your firm. So these guys in Bath in New York had um, uh, chef, uh, Michelin starred chef cooking lessons. They had a virtual safari. They did indoor Olympics. Um, social distancing, that lovely phrase that nobody knew until a couple of months ago. Um, there's some wild, wacky ideas. This to me looks like the death of the beach. Uh, it just sounds, looks horrific. Um, this from Air Asia is, to me, it's the opposite of inviting. Um, that said, a, a friend of mine the other day said, how are we going to solve this? He said, easy, Michael O'Leary is going to offer um, flights at a pound and people will put up with it. Um, I think much more likely is kind of our, our travel PPE. That's not a very realistic one. This is much more realistic. I love this. This is fit to firm in the States. I think we're going to see much bigger glasses. There's my fashion tip for the future. But these guys do um, custom fit eyewear. You can do it with your app, and it actually is protective. I think we're going to see people wearing big uh, glasses, wearing masks, and then we'll put up with the airlines um, and flying. Okay, so key questions first up. I'm very skeptical, I'm going to throw this out, I'm very skeptical about attitudinal data. Um, people love attitudinal data, but the truth is behaviour is primary. Talk to, you know, psychologists um, at uh, universities and you'll soon see that, that what really happens, if people do stuff, then they start to believe it too. People tend to believe what they do rather than do what they believe. And people still are planning to go on holiday, as you can see, this, this great COVID-19 tracker. Um, People still think about taking a holiday, but as you can see, if you look at the numbers at the bottom, 85% think about taking a UK holiday. Um, it was 81% in April, 78% in March. So they, they, you know, this, this supports the idea of domestic travel. But this thing in Australia is interesting. Western Australia, they relaxed the rules from gatherings of two people to gatherings of 10, and the beaches were packed instantly. I think people can't wait to get out. I don't know how you feel. Um, I think they also listen to what they're told. When they're told it's safe to go out, they will do it and they'll do it in their droves. Think again about that diffusion of innovations curve and the innovators, the early adopters, um, and then running through that curve. Our key thing first is to get those innovators and early adopters traveling because once the others see it safe, they will follow. Interesting learnings from China, of course, they closed first, they're reopening first. Looks like hotel occupancy is up to about 30%. It's domestic leisure travel, first of all. There is some business travel. The interesting bit, if you look at the bottom here, Golden Week, that 40% of last year, that's a huge number of people, 80 million people traveling versus 195 million in 2019. But I think that suggests quite strongly that what we'll see is a obviously a return. Um, and maybe by next year, things will be really positive. So what's going on in Europe? Um, is it going to be locals only? You know, the French are still limited to a radius close to their homes. Spanish are talking about opening their beaches. Hopefully they won't put bleach over all their beaches um, like they did in Zara de los Atunes. Um, the Greeks are very keen to open. Um, I've seen from one analyst who says back to 2019 levels by 2022. So the key then is, can you hunker down and keep your business in hibernation and kind of building back up to, um, to full uh, levels again in 2022? 
Are the old trends re trends relevant? I think absolutely. I was looking at a piece I did for um, my team put together for Kayak back in uh, December last year, and we looked at Fluxcam, you know, this concern about um, uh, the environment, um, AI being very important, friction-free. I think that's going to really take off because people won't want to have wherever possible you don't want to have to deal with a person who could breathe on you uh, wellness is going to be super important you know it's been one of the one of the wins in this time of coronavirus has been concern about mental health that's concern about loneliness and what it does to our mental health i think we're going to see quiet escapes the rise of time design is something i fundamentally believe in about this this growth of the experience economy this growth of experiences and this image here is an example of how you design time design experiences and use the hero's journey as a template. So I want to close with some key questions. And when we, when we work in workshops, we work with people. And then the best way to innovate and come up with ideas is to start with this kind of how might we. So how might we use our skills and contacts to actually help? I've seen, in fact, this is Embark. They, did, um, they flew in. They used their contacts uh, with charter flights. They flew in a bunch of uh, equipment into the U.S., to work with some of their clients. Um, how do we identify who our customers are, who are our innovators and early adopters? And how can we think about connecting with those guys? How can we figure out the future for our sector? Obviously, research is key here. Use that diffusion of innovations. Use that idea of the seed and the soil. And then mercilessly steal the best ideas and use those to create something that's right for you and your brand. How might we use this crisis to do things we wouldn't have done before? What is it, those, those things, if you think about this, what are those things that you really want to do, but you didn't have the time, and it was business as usual, so why bother? How might we think about our role as time designers? Because the truth is, we will come through this time. There will be that weird post-lockdown time. There will be a period of kind of coming back again. But if you want to connect with those innovators and early adopters, those people who have got the money, the wherewithal, and the passion to travel first, those people tend to be more experimental. Those people are the people who are already on board with the importance of experiences that are inspiring and transformative. So just kind of going back to business as usual, that, you know, if only if it was like that, just isn't really going to work. And the key question, of course, is how can we get people, or how might we get people traveling with us again? So my team and I would love to help you solve your challenges. We do this through reports and talks and workshops. If you like this deck, please send me an email. Very happy to share it with you. And if you want to know more about using that future canvas, again, very happy to share that with you. Thank you very much uh, to James for that session. I hope you all found that really interesting. Um, obviously, he can't predict the future, but really interesting to see his thoughts on what it might look like. Um, James is now going to be joining us for the live Q&A part. Uh, he should be joining us shortly. There he is. I'm just going to unmute him. Welcome, James. Hello. Hello. How are you, Sophie? I'm good, thank you. I think there's a slight delay on your sound, perhaps, but it's all fine. Um, just to all of our audience, we do have um, the Q&A function. If I can ask you all to use that rather than the chat um, to direct any of your questions you might have at James. Um, and I'll put them all to him. Um, just to kickstart the conversation though, it was quite interesting you said about virtual travel sitting alongside normal travel. I know a few years ago, um, there were lots of people talking about VR might replace um, yeah. travel as it is, but I guess the lockdown has kind of emphasized, if anything, the need for people to get out and experience the world. I was at um, a SCIFT conference probably about five, six years ago now in New York and um, it was one of my early experiences of, of travel VR and it, I think it was like Hamilton Island or one of those really fancy five-star islands off the northeast coast of Australia, I think that's where it is. And, uh, you know, I put on these goggles and it was amazing. I was in a helicopter, I was with this super hot girl swimming through, um, you know, turtles and stuff and it was amazing. And um, I'm one of these people who's quite vocal. And so by the time I took this thing off, there were like a whole bunch of people around me kind of going, who is this freak going mad? <laughs> and the woman there uh, who was you know, from the company said, wow, does that make you want to go there? And I just said, do you know, no, it makes me want to do more VR. Okay. It didn't inspire me about the destination. I know what swimming is. I know what sailing is. I know what um, the helicopter is, I, you know. Um, <laughs> 
I just think these things will sit alongside. I mean, just, just imagine now if you've had the choice to watch, I mean, wildlife programs are possibly slightly different, but just think of, yeah, you know, watching a program about lions. And I was in Uganda a few years ago for CNN, and it was only the third day that we actually saw some lions. And it was, it was actually about four hours before I was leaving to go back to the capital. And it would have been hugely disappointing not to have seen lions. But when we saw them, they were real and they could have eaten me. It was very <laughs> different from watching, you know, my, my you know, lovely TV with my kids. Yeah. Watching, yeah. You know, it has its place. It can be really inspiring. It won't replace. And, and yeah. um, I can't imagine what the haptics would have to be like to make you want to do VR rather than the real thing. Mm -hmm. And if anything, with the lockdown, people are just itching to get out and to, to go and see the world, aren't they? You know, we're, we're seeing that with people wanting to visit parks and really enjoy their experiences more than ever. Yeah, this is, I think, hugely positive for the travel industry because, of course, there's a huge amount of fear at the moment. Mm. Um, and I was, you know, I've got a good friend who lives in Berlin and he just, he's like, wow, but everyone's coming out now. He's just bought a bike to get out so that he, you know, get out and do stuff. And a friend of mine in Australia who points out that um, stuff about Western Australia to me. You know, when you go from two people to 10 people and that suddenly fills the beaches, that tells you something about yeah. people. Now, I mean, it's worth pointing out, of course, we have the second highest number of, um, you know, deaths in the world. It's been, a, yeah. you know, pretty awful. Uh, and it, it is. And there is definitely going to be certain sectors, which is why I threw in that stuff there about depends on the sector that you're in. If your key market is, um, you know, older people, boomers, going on wonderful trips around Asia, um, thinking of my in-laws and, and uh, my dad and his, his wife on some of the trips they've been on in the past few years, um, that's, that's not going to be great for you. Maybe the key thing there is, is to think about, you know, let's play with the idea of preferred partners. Mm. So where is there no COVID-19? And maybe what you then do is you, uh, you know, I'm playing as you can tell, but you know, maybe you, you charter the whole plane or you charter the whole front, you know, the, the front of the plane plus six rows back. Yeah. You have people that are on some sort of, I don't know, you could do a crazy thing where you have five days, and for five days, they have to be in a, a, you know, a locked environment. They get picked up from their home. Um, and, you know, I'm just thinking of ways that you could move around this to get people traveling again. Because one of the challenges, and I'm fascinated by the, you know, the thermal imaging, um, the Turkish authorities, you know, demanding some sort of proof, is that if nothing shows up, if, you know, if lots of people are asymptomatic and their temperature doesn't go up, then it doesn't really matter about the health certificate. Yeah, that is the challenge. Um, James, we do have some questions coming through, so I'm going to try and rattle through them. Um, we've got someone from Anonymous. How do we identify innovators and early adapter customers? Early adopter customers, I think. That was back to your slide when you were uh, explaining how to kind of how to use the theory, the theories that you come up with. So they said, how do we identify innovators and early adopter customers? Okay, so there's a, um, there's a real difference. This wonderful uh, in the original Diffusion Innovations book uh, that looks at the difference between, as you go through that from the innovators through to the laggards. So the innovators, uh, and you know, the further to the left you go, the innovators and the early adopters as opposed to the laggards and the majority, innovators tend to be at the top of the socioeconomic pyramid. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to be richer, they tend to be in cities, they tend to travel more, they tend to read more. They also tend to be influenced by advertising. Um, so if it was me, I would try and parse my, uh, the trips that I offer. I mean, you know, obviously this is different for different people uh, mm -hmm. who are on this. Um, I'd parse the trips that I offer and I would parse the uh, kind of clients that we sell to. And I don't know, obviously it depends on how much information you have about them. So you might want to look at um, demographic or psychographic data. You might want to look at where they live, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would try and connect with those people first. And you could do, you know, you could sit, do simple kind of smoke screen tests. You could identify, I don't know, I'm just playing here as you can tell, but you know, you try and find your beachhead market um, and find 50 people who, who you think, okay, these are among the wealthiest people that we sell to. They you know, they're going to tend to be younger, not necessarily. You can have innovators at all ages. Um, and then go to them and say, we're thinking of doing this. What do you think of this way of moving things forward? When would you be up for it? Okay. Uh, we've got another question. Which other industry could help the travel industry get back on its feet? Who can we learn from? That's quite an interesting one. Putting you on the spot there. Yeah, retail. Mm. 
retail uh, is the obvious one, especially if you look at, um, you know, Germany in terms of what's opening up now, um, you know, some bigger stores. I saw a wonderful piece of science that looked at the difference between shopping in small stores and bigger stores. And this was done by a guy who was an ep epidemiologist from MIT, uh, mm -hmm. now a startup over in um, the West Coast of the States. And this is why one of the reasons why I'm more convinced now about the importance of face masks. Mm -hmm. um, so, and obviously washing, disinfecting is really important. And what's kind of really interesting there was that if you go into a sort of, you know, what they call in the States a mom and pop store, but your local store, you've got fewer people that have been in there um, compared to a larger store. And, and that reduces your likelihood of coming into contact with a droplet from somebody who's been, you know, who's brought COVID-19 in um, dramatically. Um, but if everybody wears a face mask and washes their hands and is conscious of that, it brings the likelihood down even in a major store. So the two meter distancing as well, actually, two meter distancing and the yeah. face mask drop the chances of um, infection being carried from one person to another dramatically. So once you look at those numbers and you look at what retailers are doing, and obviously large re retailers want people to, um, you know, continue shopping. And, you know, that means that the world is starting again. <laughs> you think about it, the idea of being allowed out more than once yeah. a day. Um, I yeah, I would look to retail and see how that, but, but there again, I think we're seeing that already. If you look at that work that Accor are doing, um, I think Marriott's work in terms of the kind of contact list, um, you know, check-in is really inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see robots doing more cleaning. That said, if you've got a person wearing a mask, that's going to help too. Like that Hong Kong airport one. Um, yeah. We've got an interesting one here. What do you think of the future of group travel? That's from Vivek. What does this mean? For uh, group it really travel? depends on the kind of group. Um, you know, nine out of 10 people that are being killed by this are older. Nine out of 10 people have got these underlying health conditions. So if you were looking at, uh, you know, Intrepid or something um, and you're appealing to sort of millennials, millennials are probably going to be fine anyway. Um, they're the ones that are itching to get out already. I'm intrigued at um, a sort of company. This again, this is Embark in New York. I think a really innovative, very entrepreneurial who are looking at sort of taking a couple of villas together and going on kind of like two, three families together. Um, obviously that increases risk, but you can see the way they're doing it in Australia. So mm -hmm. you go from you're not allowed to see other people outside of your household to, okay, you can see it can be two people you can gather and now it's 10 people. So groups make a lot of sense. And if you think about it, and this is one of the funny things about travel anyway, I've got this theory that the design and all, all that stuff is around about attracting the right kind of people. Cause you know, when you go down to breakfast, and there are the people having breakfast in that room and you're like, you're not my people. <laughs> another place where you go down at breakfast and there's all those people and you think, I'd like to talk to you at the bar later kind of thing. Yeah. You know if you're in the right kind of place. And um, organize, you know, organized group travel where you feel that those people, you can trust them in some way. And let's face it, we all want to get back together again with our families and see our families. Mm. Uh, I think that's going to be interesting. I think people will be more up for it. Think about the fact as well that, you know, people in multi-generational homes, um, they're going to want to travel together. Yeah. Okay. So that's a nice positive answer. Uh, Andrew says, I guess moving this on a little bit, uh, how do you see the impacts of COVID-19 having differing impacts on the classic, classic package style holiday compared to the do-it-yourself Airbnb style holiday? Because I guess with this, the whole point is that you want someone to talk to <laughs> If something happens, you know, the travel agents have been working all hours around the clock trying to help all of their clients. Yeah, I, I remember seeing Derek Jones's uh, message on Twitter or something where he said, "We've got everybody home." And I think <laughs> there was real, I think a real satisfaction. I think, um, you know, satisfaction. I, I think one of the things that he'd said was the satisfaction that the systems that they'd had in place to look after their guests had worked. Mm. You know. That's what you would expect. But when, you, when things go wrong, you need to feel like you can trust somebody. So from that perspective, there's a real plus side on the package uh, side of thing. Airbnb is really interesting. Let's say you're in a situation where you're wondering for a moment about the cleanliness of a place, 
okay, and you're thinking, okay, am I going to go and stay in uh, an Accor place where they teamed up with, you know, this Bureau of Veritas who've been around since 1828? Or are you going to go and stay in some Airbnb place who say they've cleaned it? Really, yeah. It's interesting what that'll do. Um, I think we'll, we need to trust things. I bet Airbnb, if they haven't released it already and I've missed it, will be working on something similar. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, you know, one of the nice things about, you know, I think there'll be road trips will be big, obviously domestic travel. You don't have to go through the tension. Yeah. Okay. Oh, James, your sounds, your sounds just disappeared. James, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but your, your sound has just totally gone. I know we had this problem yesterday a little bit. Can you bring it, can we bring you back in for one more question? Or oh. no, can we, can you hear us? No, okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, yeah, you're yeah, I can, sorry. Well, do you know what? I'm, I am conscious of time. I know you shared your email address. Um, can we share that again for um, all the delegates to kind of perhaps see your presentation again? Or I know you said that they could view that if they emailed you. Yeah, very happy to. I'll, I'll send Great. the link. So very happy to share it. Um, I think, you know, obviously I've been working this for a while, but figuring out what to do and using that um, diffusion of innovations that understanding of the soil so when you <clears throat> the seed in the soil <clears throat> if you understand where you believe the world is going and then you think you know let's say you're in a virtual um meeting with 10 of your colleagues or five of your colleagues or whatever and you're saying okay is this any good as an idea is this going to fly is this going to help our business continue and survive so that we've actually got a product for summer 2021 mm -hmm. um you can look at it and say okay is it better is it really, is it, does it tick the box? Is it going to make a difference? Is it compatible with how we do things now? And you can run through that because checklist, not to say, oh, it's no good or it's good, but to play that how might we gain? Because everything yeah. is rescuable. Everything you can make better. And the key is to kind of play that positive, creative game to create something that's more relevant for people uh, today in the next few months as we slowly ease out of lockdown. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, James. I really appreciate that. And we are going to share your email address in the chat function as well. Thanks. Thanks so again, James. good luck, everybody. Thank Interesting you. Times. Yeah, indeed.